just to uh, orient everyone here, so on the website, day three, GPR, and you can go to the tutorial here that's been rendered. Um, we're going to start with some slides, and you can either just follow, on, follow along, I'll share my screen, uh, those slides shortly, or the link here um, if you'd like to have a copy yourself. Um, so what we're going to do here, as I started to say, is uh, maybe give a brief kind of introduction to GPR just to get everyone on the same page about how we collect it, um, what we do for processing. And then uh, Kate will take it away for the second half of this tutorial and really uh, dig into working with the data. So I'd like to acknowledge um, both Ryan and, and Tate and their contributions to uh, this presentation. And uh, a, a major thanks to Tate for his uh, heavy lifting on the tutorial development. For those that have not been out to Grand Mesa, this is a photo that Ryan took um, of some GPR being collected during the Snow X 2020 campaign. So what I hope to cover in the next, say, 10 to 15 minutes is um, kind of introduce what GPR is, um, how it's collected and processed, um, where we've collected it during these uh, recent campaigns, and then how to access the data um, and, and what the files actually contain when you were to access them. Uh, this is uh, another photo from, this one's from Cameron Pass, one of the time series sites, um, actually from this past winter, the Snow X 21 campaign. So ground penetrating radar or GPR for short is an electromagnetic method um, that um, precisely measures the two-way travel time of a radio wave through a, a medium. And a medium of interest in this case is snow. And so basically what GPR gives us is spatially distributed measurements of uh, snow depth. And so again, a photo here on the left of kind of the data collection. Um, for the most part, um, in recent campaigns, we've collected GPR um, in a sled dragged behind someone snowshoeing or skiing. Out of the Mesa, um, a lot of this data collection was done uh, by attaching the sled behind a snowmobile. This allowed us to cover a lot more ground um, during those campaigns, given the open nature of, of the Mesa. So the basic uh, equation that we're working with here to get uh, snow depth, or DS here, is we're going to measure the travel time um, for that radio wave to travel from the transmitting antenna down to the snow ground interface, and then back up to uh, the receiving uh, antenna. We're going to multiply that travel time, well, once we divide it by two, um, we're going to multiply that by velocity. And I'll spend some time in subsequent slides talking about velocity, because that's an important parameter that we need to determine in order to get accurate estimates of snow depth from our GPR observations. The result of um, kind of collecting and then processing this radar is a radar gram, and that's what's pictured uh, down here at the bottom uh, of the slide. And so just to orient you to this figure, uh, distance along the x-axis, so a roughly 200 meter long transect that we collect at GPR. Uh, on the left y-axis is a two-way travel time in nanoseconds, and on the right axis is depth below the surface. So the snow ground, sorry, the snow air interface is the top of the, of the radar gram. And then you can see this uh, bright reflector that I've noted with an arrow here is the snow uh, ground interface. And this is the primary reflector that we're interested in and what we've um, archived at uh, the National Snow and Ice Data Center. You can see in the radar grams that there's more, a lot more information to these radar grams. You can see the internal stratigraphy in the snowpack, um, but the primary product that we've developed um, are uh, snow depth and snow water equivalent estimates. So GPR, as I said, is an uh, electromagnetic method that's really sensitive to something called dielectric permittivity, or epsilon. For those that are not familiar with this term, it's a physical property that describes how easily a material is polarized. So a material that has high uh, dielectric permittivity is going to polarize more easily in an electric field and therefore store more energy as a result. So in our GPR surveys, um, we've used antenna frequencies between 500 and 1600 megahertz. Um, at the low end, at 500 megahertz, those are most suitable for really thick snowpack, say in, in coastal maritime Alaska, where you might have five or more meters of snow, um, versus in you know continental climate here in Colorado, with say two meters of snow, um, we might have about we might use a, a 1600 megahertz antenna. I just realized I never even introduced myself to start. Uh, I'm at Colorado State University in, in Fort Collins, Colorado, hence the reference to, to Colorado here. Um, so these GPR systems use uh, discrete pulses of high frequency radio waves. And as those radio waves transmit through the snow, um, they are going to reflect and refract at boundaries in these dielectric properties. Um, and these are subsequently received and recorded by the antenna uh, on the surface. And so when you see a radar gram, really what we're seeing is a 2D image of these variations in dielectric permittivity in the subsurface. We're seeing these interfaces between variations in dielectric uh, properties. 
And just to uh, illustrate this, um, here's a video from um, Cameron Pass again from this past winter. Um, we, one of our time series sites moved this past year um, into the Cameron Peak wildfire. This was the largest fire in Colorado history um, and that burned in the Cashel Gooder Basin near Cameron Pass. So we, we worked up there quite extensively this past winter. So um, a, a lot of information on this table. Um, I'm going to try to just highlight a few key points here, talking about dielectric permittivity and radar velocity to set the stage for how we uh, calculate snow depths from our observed two-way travel times. So first, I want to highlight uh, two columns. First, this dielectric constant, which is on the left-hand side, and then velocity here, um, which I've highlighted in green and, and red. So the first thing to note is that our EM waves are always going to travel slower in geologic materials than in air. Um, in air and a vacuum, it's going to move at uh, 0.3 meters per nanosecond or three times 10 to the eighth uh, meters per second. So as you increase the amount of kind of material in the snowpack, and this material is ice, um, so the snow density is going to increase, your velocity is going to decrease. But an important thing um, and one of the benefits of GPR as a method is that the velocity is not particularly sensitive to variations in density. You can have a roughly 20% variation in density, and you might only see a 4 to 5% uh, variation in, in velocity. So it's not particularly sensitive to it, but we still want to get that uh, velocity right to get the most accurate uh, snow depths. Another important thing to point out on this table is that electromagnetic waves are going to travel much slower in water um, uh, saturated materials, uh, wet snow in this case. Um, and so that's one of the um, major um, both limitations and area of active research is, is you know, what are the spatial temporal variations in liquid water content in the snowpack and how is that going to uh, impact the radar velocity, particularly as we uh, look to the launch of, of NISAR um, in, in 2023. A little bit of a, a sidestep here. Um, I've been describing one of the approaches that we've used to collect this GPR data, and this is a different approach. Um, and there's a slightly nuanced uh, difference here. And this is something that Kate and, and HP have been using primarily. Um, and this is a multipolarization GPR setup. So we're using the same kind of commercial components here for the most part, but a second antenna has been added and that antenna has been rotated so that it is uh, polarized relative to the transmitting receiver. Uh, so basically what we're getting are both an HH, a copolar, and an HV cross-polar received signal. Um, and so this multipolarization approach, as I'll show in a couple slides, um, can be uh, used to automatically detect um, the snow ground interface on the basis of the maximum coherence. And this is, this is work that Tate's really pushing forward and uh, recently presented at the Eastern Snow Conference. So I just want to spend a couple slides talking about how this GPR data is processed from the raw data to basically what we're archiving at NSIDC. Um, it is important to note, and I will come back to this, that we are archiving the raw data at NSIDC. So if you're interested in just grabbing the raw data that we've collected, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and all of that has been um, posted to uh, NSIDC as uh, raw. Uh, format. But most of the process data that most people will probably grab um, have kind of gone through these steps to derive a snow water equivalent and, and snow depth. So the first step that we do is a time zero correction. And basically what we're doing is we're shifting the radar gram, the signal in the radar gram higher up. And so if we look at the top uh, figure here down to the bottom one, you note that we've shifted the direct wave up to the surface. And so we do a trace varying time zero correction to make you make that jump up uh, and basically make the direct wave the, the zero uh, nanoseconds. We verify that it's been done correctly with something uh, that we refer to as up downs. And so this is pictured in the bottom left here. So we pick the radar sled up and then lower it back down, pick it up, lower it back down. And basically those are the wiggles that we're seeing in this um, radar gram on the bottom left. Those are the ground and snow ground interface or the air snow interface and the snow ground interface changing in relative distance to the transmitter and receiver. But what's constant there is the direct wave. And so we're able to basically verify and separate what's the you know, snow ground interface and the air snow interface relative to the instrument. We also apply a number of other processing steps and those are all kind of um, uh, uh, clumped together here in these two radar grams that I'm picturing. So we're gonna do a de-wow filter. This is basically removes the low frequency noise from the radar signal. Um, we also are going to remove the background, and so you can see those linear kind of direct wave features at the top and the ringing uh, have been removed. We've also at times applied a bandpass filter to kind of limit the frequencies of the radar energy that we're uh, looking at. Associated with the uh, GPR instruments are GPS units, uh, and we've used a variety of different uh, GPS units depending on 
who's collecting and where, where it's being collected. Um, and some groups have done equidistant trace spacing. And so basically what we're doing here is assigning um, uh, each, well, because we have a variable velocity, whether that's a snowmobile or someone dragging the sled across the, uh, across the mesa, we want to make our resulting radar gram, um, the x-axis equal in space. And so we just uh, resample that um, to this equidistant trace spacing. And then the last step is we pick the reflector. This can be done manually. There's some nice semi-automatic algorithms that can assist with that. Um, and the nice work that Tate's been doing here with the uh, coherence between the HH and HV um, allows us to be uh, automatically detected with that setup. Okay, so I said I'd come back to radar velocity calculation. Um, for all the data that we've archived at NSIDC, we've used the approach that's illustrated here. And there are other approaches, um, and we have archived the raw two-way travel times as well in the level one product. So you're welcome to grab the travel times and develop your own velocity models that are you know, maybe spatially varying or something like that, um, and apply that to get your snow depths and snow water equivalents. Um, but for what we've archived, um, we've used this approach here. So we take a either a nearby snow pit or the mean of a bunch of snow pits. Uh, and this is all described in the metadata. Um, we take the column average densities of those snow pits. We then apply an empirical relationship from Kovacs et al. 1995 that relates the observed snow density to a dielectric permittivity. And once we have that dielectric permittivity, we can use the second equation here um, uh, to solve for the velocity of uh, that radar wave in the snow. So during the SnowX 2020 campaign at uh, Cameron Pass, and that's what's being illustrated here. So each of those uh, colored lines correspond to a 10 centimeter increment of density. Um, and we were out there you know, from December to March. And I just plotted those, um, kind of converted those densities to velocities and then plotted those here on the, the figure in the bottom right. And so you can see, you know, we saw an increase in density from roughly 200 to slightly over 300 kilograms per cubic meter. And that changes the velocity from roughly 0.235 to you know, 0.25 uh, meters per, per nanosecond. You'll note that the velocity and density are inversely related. That's something I've highlighted yet, but uh, helps to minimize some of the uncertainty of um, not knowing perhaps or, or variations in density uh, in, the, in the landscape. So where was GPR data collected uh, during the SnowX campaign? SnowX 17 um, was at Grand Mesa during SnowX 20, was both the Grand Mesa IOP and then two uh, time series sites, Cameron Pass and, and Jemez in New Mexico. And then during SnowX 21, Cameron Pass, Little Cottonwood Canyon and Banner Summit. Um, if you are actually looking at these slides, both hopefully all of these links are active um, and will bring you to either the NSIDC website that has all this data or to uh, the WR our papers that describe um, these data sets. Just a map view here um, from the 2020 data collection and the bottom figure actually highlights a little bit of the 2017 campaign as well at uh, Grand Mesa. Now, I think one of the key things to point out here, you know, we've talked about the fact that GPR gives us this much higher uh, spatial sampling density than say probing, you know, rather than three or five meter spacing, we're basically getting 10 meter spacing. And rather than getting 30,000 observations, which is monumental in itself uh, in terms of manual snow depth probes, um, I think we yield something like 1.3 million snow depth observations during the, the Snow X 17 campaign at Grand Mesa. So, you know, orders of magnitude increase in terms of the number of observations. And this really helps link our ground observations to our airborne and spaceborne observations. So it's a really important tool for kind of linking these spatial scales because we can get much greater spatial coverage with the GPR, particularly when it's towed behind a snowmobile um, uh, in the landscape. I think I'm running a little late or long here, Tate. I'll try to hurry up so I don't shortchange you on the, on the tutorial. Um, just some uh, pretty pictures here in terms of what we can do with this. Uh, this is from, uh, from Cameron Pass looking at snow depths on three transects through time during the 2020 campaign. One last thing to highlight here is the fact that GPR is a really um, kind of the best uh, data set to one of the best data sets for evaluating UAV SAR. It's one of the most direct kind of connections. UAV SAR is a, is a phase-based approach, a change detection approach. They're looking at the change in phase from one flight interval to the next flight. Um, and GPR is essentially doing the same thing. We're measuring travel time, which can be directly related to uh, this, this change in phase that the UAV SAR uh, airborne platform is seeing. And so that's on the bottom uh, right here on the right-hand side, I'm just showing SWE change over each one of these uh, flight intervals. 
some more pretty pictures from Grand Mesa here, looking at snow depth variability um, and some work that Tate's been doing here, doing average snow density. So he's inverting uh, GPR travel times um, by using an independent snow depth from airborne LIDAR to basically rearrange the equation that I presented previously to get uh, snow, snow density across the Mesa. So one other thing that can be done with uh, these, these products. So where can I access the data? Um, all at NSIDC, I'm not gonna belabor this now, but um, all those links should be active. The one thing we've tried to do uh, between all the different submissions and different groups, is we've tried to have a uniform uh, structure to these files. So hopefully it makes uh, further analysis um, less of a headache. Um, and basically the file content should have all these same columns, um, you know, both uh, lat long and easting and northings, our two-way travel time, the density that was used. Uh, that's not density at that specific location. It's just the density that was used for that observation to get subsequently uh, a velocity, which we apply to get the snow depth uh, and snow water equivalent. So I think while this is up, um, these are just a summary of what I've covered in terms of what is GPR, where it's been collected, how we're processing it. Um, and thanks to both the NASA THP award, uh, the SNOX leadership team throughout all these campaigns and the many field assistants that made all of this possible. Uh, and thanks to the eScience Institute and all of the presentations and tutorials before here, I've, I've learned a ton. It's been a fire hose of information. And I've really enjoyed it. So thanks to everyone. And at this point, I can take a minute or two of questions, maybe while I switch screens to, to Tate and Tate will take it away for the actual GPR tutorial. You should have hopefully be able to share now, Tate. Yep. Uh, you all seeing my screen okay? Yeah, it looks great. Cool. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the uh, introduction to the GPR. You did great. Don't worry about the time. I think people are going to see that a lot of the information in my tutorial here is um, re repeated from some of the others. So in terms of interfacing with the database. Um, but if there's no questions about what is GPR, we'll, we'll continue and I can build any questions that come in as we go. So um, let me see, I'm looking at the book here. Let me move over to the notebook. Um, in this tutorial, uh, we're gonna be using the SNOX database to get the GPR travel time data. So these are the from the BSU radar with the automatic travel time picks is, is what's currently in the database. Um, and anything, any of the waveform data, like the actual radar grams and imagery, that that's not here, but we've kind of taken care of that for you. So this is just an end product, which is the two-way travel time, as Dan is explaining. So the this example here, we're, we're gonna focus on one pit location at, at pit 1S1, um, which has a spiral around it that we collected with the GPR. And uh, we'll grab the snow pit density there um, from the layer data, the magna probe data from the spiral, and the GPR data in order to compare the snow depths uh, estimated by the GPR and measured by the magna probe. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Um, first, first thing we need to do is run the section to get all of our libraries imported for the SNOX database and matplotlib and SQL Alchemy, which has some, some handy dandy tools for us. Uh, as Micah and Scott have really done a great job explaining how these things work. So the, the first step we've got to do, and, and this is something that you can change on your own, is identify a pit location, 1S1. I, I guess one caveat here is that the not all the radar data inside the database right now it, for every pit is available. So there's only, there's only a few that you could choose from it, and maybe it would have been best if I had listed those. Um, also, we're going to pick a buffer distance around the snow pit, and this is a radius of 50 meters. And now we've 
connected to the database and uh, query the location, uh, limiting it to one field. Okay, so in, in this next chunk, we, we use the uh, uh, post GIS uh, stuff happening in the background to build a polygon a circle around the snow pit site. And um, now we, we've buffered the pit and grabbed any, uh, any of the, well, we, ha we have now the tools to get the GPR data in, in, this, in the snow depth data from around our snow pit here. Hey, Tate, could you zoom in a little bit? Oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. No I, you know, I, I meant to do that already. Thank you. But, okay. <clears throat> Okay, and, and so like Dan was explaining, in, in order to estimate the depth of the radar, we have to first know something about the snow density in order to do this wave speed conversion. So what we're going to do is just grab the average density from our snow pit 1S1. And how we apply that here is, um, first there's a bit of a gotcha. I think what happens here is in the layer data, things are, uh, as a string format inside the database in order to handle some of the non-numerical entries from the snow pit data. So we have to cast those values to a float in order to calculate the average densities. That's what's happening here. So we'll cast all the data to a float and in this next line, uh, we filter that to grab the density data. So we now have, uh, if we run this query, we have the average density of all the snow pits if we limit that to our site ID 1S1, uh, we have the average density for that snow pit. And um, while that's running, when it completes, it'll tell us what those densities are. Server must be getting hit pretty hard right now. It's taking a minute. Hmm. One of those unexpected consequences. Unless something else catastrophic is going on with the Jupiter hub right now, I, I don't know. I think it could just be at, um, the microstructure tutorial is also using the database right now. Maybe everyone's trying to run at the same time. Well, hopefully that will catch up. Um, if not, I can go over to the rendered version and why don't, why don't I just do that? Cause there's really, there's nothing it, that. It ran okay for some people. They just popped in on the, on the Slack channel and mine ran okay, so. Oh, okay, good. Well, that's good. You, yeah, you can keep playing along, um, but it looks like mine's still hung up. So um, what you should see if it, if it did run is uh, that the average density for all the snow pits is 266 and the average density of 1S1 is 245. Zoom in again so you can see that more clearly. Okay, so effectively we've searched the database. We got our snow density that we need. And maybe I should try restarting the kernel. It was just suggested in the Slack too, yeah. Yeah, cool. That did work. Okay. So the the next thing that we're going to do is apply our, our buffer to the GPR travel time data. And so the the point measurements here, the GPR data and the magna probe data is, is in point data within the database. That's it's a point data type, which is just a one value with the geolocation. Um so we're going to uh there's a few ways we could skin this cat. You can filter the point data by the instrument type, which the instrument here that we'd be curious for is the GPR, the Pulse Echo Pro. Um, alternatively, and this is the way that I've done it, is we filter it by the type of data. So in point data, there's three types. There's SWE, there's depth, and travel time. And for the GPR, we obviously want the two-way travel time. So um 
querying the point data and filtering it to to a travel time. And just as a kind of like a catch all or almost like a safety mechanism, we just want to limit our search to the date of this acquisition. So here's another little piece of prior information that you'd want to know just so we don't uh, get, I, it's possible that there's multiple days of GPR acquisitions at the same location. So we just wanted to filter this down to the same day that the snow pit was dug that we're looking at. Okay. So we filtered that query a bit and the last, the last step that we're going to do is apply the buffer to it. So again, we're filtering it using the funk and uh, applying our buffer to that query. So now that's going to restrict from all the GPR data collected on this date. Now it's going to filter out at anything that's beyond 50 meters from our snow pit. And we squeeze that query into a GeoPandas data frame. And what I've done here in this last little line is just renamed the default name is value and we just replace that with travel time so we know uh, what our variable is and we're going to work with it that way inside the data frame. So here's uh, what the travel times look like. Um, what's, I guess the point worth noting here is the density of the samples, like Dan had mentioned, they're about 10 centimeters per measurement along the track. So quite high resolution of snow depth effectively um, when we compare that to the depth probes, which have an interval of about three meters. So the color bar here is a travel time where a smaller travel time number four or in this southeast quadrant is shallower snow and deeper blues closer to nine, eight, nine, ten nanoseconds is going to be deeper snow. So this is a neat little example because it has uh, a good bit of variability. That's pretty much all of the variability that we would see in terms of depth at Grand Mesa from this from the survey from about 50 centimeters of snow to a little over one meter of snow. So that's a pretty good sample. Um, so we have the travel time data and the, the next step we need to do is convert this to depth. So we're going to use this Kovacs et al. 95 equation, which is pretty much the classic example that that everybody knows and loves. And so we plug in the snow density, convert it to relative permittivity and move that into the wave speed so we can calculate depth. So that's all happening inside this next chunk of code. Um, and that's pretty straightforward. You have to remember that we have measured a two-way travel time. And so we need to divide that by two that's where this factor of two comes from. So then we uh, calculate the depths here for the GPR and, and put that into a, a data frame here. So I've got one data frame rolling for the GPR and in the next chunk, we'll build a data frame for the probed data. And just so we can prove to ourselves what we're doing, we've added this travel time column and now beside it, we have depth in centimeters as well. So we're just going to be growing this data frame as we go through these chunks. And so in a similar fashion, we're going to work through the database to filter uh, and grab this magna probe data. Again, like there's pro there's a few approaches you could do this. So first we filter by the type that we want. And I guess at this particular site, the only other instrument that was used is the is the ruler from the snow pit. But I've just gone ahead and only grabbed the magna probe data here on this particular date, and then applied the buffer to it. So we completed that query and we squeeze it into a data frame, and this is called the DF probe. And here we can see simply that we, we've got snow depth and location data for all these things. So uh, it's important to be using two different data frames here because 
well, they're not the same size, so we wouldn't really be able to add um, the probe depth to the data frame for the radar because there's far more radar measurements than depth measurements. And, and of course, they're also at different locations, which is, uh, which is leads us to our next section. If we have these uh, measurements in different locations and we're trying to compare them, we have to do a really important step of interpolation. And in, in this example, we just are going to use inverse distance weighting from an algorithm which I borrowed from Stack Overflow. So that was pretty handy. Um, this is a pretty simple implementation. Um, all that inverse distance weighting really does is uh, computes a weighted average of the points. So um, if X and Y are the GPR coordinates, XI and YI are the interpolation sites, which are the magna probe locations. And so you just calculate the distance between all these points in a loop looping over I and calculating the weights as one over the distance. And then you always have to normalize these weights, right? So they sum to one. And then this multiplication is just going to compute the average. So um, there's a little bit of detail in this paragraph about how Python is doing that. Um, but it is, it's just inside of their universal functions for the subtract outer call, all it's doing is looping through these points and doing that little bit of math. And again, this is, th these variables or, or excuse me, these functions is what I've just grabbed from Stack Overflow and put in here. So now um, we've done this interpolation step and, and our, we can add the GPR depths to our data frame for the probes because now we have made an estimate of the depth at each one of these locations for the from the GPR and then calculated the air as well, which would just be the depth probe depth minus the GPR depth. And here we just print out the head of that data frame so we can see that's happened. So um, the next thing we got to do is just say, hey, how, how good did this technique work? Um, and the very simple things we always go back to is correlation. If we're comparing apples to apples, um, we can we also calculate the, the bias using the mean error and then the root mean squared error. So these are just a few summary statistics. Um, there are a few potential sources of error. And I guess maybe before I swipe down there, I would open it up to, to ask if anybody has any input onto what might be some causes of error that that we have. So we have between, on average, about 10 centimeters of error, give or take. Let's just look at those numbers. Um, if anybody wants to chime in, that's fine. If not, uh, I'll give you the answers. Be be interesting to see if there's a systematic shift in all those errors where maybe that like initial pick of the surface was off or something, one of those processing steps in the GPR, um, or if they're all over the, the board. Or if uh, I'm thinking about like in really light snow, if your sled is sinking in a little bit. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I can I can definitely comment on my experience with that. And Scott, that was that's a good one because that's not neither of those are on the list. So either y'all read the list and outsmarted me. Um, that's great. So with the uh, with the compaction of the snow from the sled, I find that as long as you're not losing snow mass, like as long as the sled or the snowmobile is not kicking the snow out from underneath the radar, that the compaction of the snow um, is offset by the height of the snow. So it, to the radar, it's actually kind of insensitive. Um, and then a good systematic bias and a reason why we would check with the mean error is to see if there was something with the picks, which happens quite often in GPR is that you have to pick a long phase of that wavelet and you could be tracking 
the wrong wavelet phase, which would give you an error of five to 10 centimeters thereabouts for these wavelengths. Um, I'll just comment on a couple of these other mistakes that we could have. Again, the density from the snow pit is really important. That's how we're doing all of this. So if you use a different density, you'll come up with different depths, which can vary on the order of 10 centimeters or so. Um, the depth probe themselves is a really small point that's measuring about a one centimeter squared on the ground where the radar has a footprint of, let's say about one meter squared on the ground. And so the sensitivity of those instruments is slightly different where there could be a high point or a rock or something that the depth probe happened to encounter, but the radar maybe not seeing it the same way. Um, there's, all, there's always location errors, especially with the Magna probe. Its GPS has about three meter accuracy and, and trying to sync these two instruments is always a trick. And that we're, we're kind of unable to do anything about that other than apply this algorithm to interpolate them. Um, but again, that algorithm is not, it's not the best one and I would encourage you to maybe use a different one, or, or if you're gonna play this tutorial on your own, uh, to use a different interpolation scheme that's maybe a little more localized um, to the points. Just for reference, the, the algorithm up here is looking through all the points. So it, it's gonna be calculating weights for points that are up to 100 meters apart. Um, where really we wanna be looking in a smaller neighborhood of three to five meters or so. Is, a good number. So that could be something to do. Um, and this last code chunk just makes the plots and, and tells us how good we did. Correlation of 0.64 is okay. It's pretty acceptable in my experience. And this bias is pretty much zero. So the picks are okay. Root mean squared error of 10 centimeters is about what we can expect to achieve with this method. Um, and uh, that's, that's about all I have uh, to add for you here. I'm happy to take any more questions or comments. I think it's, it's really cool to hear some input on this stuff from you all. Thanks, Scott. Oh, this is great. Thanks for the slides and presentation. I one question that comes to mind is uh, seeing in, in the slides earlier, I guess there was talk about the uh, more than just the ground snow interface, like are you able to detect additionally and kind of verify layers within the snowpack with some of these other uh, SnowX um, instruments? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. It's, it, it really is more work for the radar interpreter to, to get in there and do that because it's it's tricky. Those layers aren't nearly as continuous or obvious to pick out, but it really that's more of a task for this FMCW radar that HP uh, was using at SnowX and it's higher frequency, shorter wavelength. So it's able to capture the stratigraphy a, a lot more neatly. Um, one experiment that is just sitting there waiting to be done is to track some of those layers over time like Dan had done for the ground reflection. But you could also use that as an, any one of those layers that you see in this time series data as a kind of an interval board in a way that you can track the snow growth from any one of those layers. Oh, cool. We did get on time, so I'm happy about that. Yeah, and, and just to make note, another thing that I have done in the past with GPR um, is done something similar to this, but instead of using the density from the pit to estimate a velocity, just like calibrate it to like the first 25 depth measurements, right? Like if you have that and then just have that as as your calibration and then you can you can get depth from that way it really depends on what your end goal is um 
I think for for these purposes with all the data sets that we submitted to NSIDC, SWE was the ultimate end goal. And so using the, the density is kind of the best way for that, but it really depends on what you're trying to use the GPR data for. And I think there's a lot of uh, different ways you can go about it.